It's actually about um, integrating quality, uh, long-lived marketing approaches that um, have stood the test of time with technologies that work for today's environment. And then looking at your customer, first of all, and then mapping digital marketing channels that are appropriate for your customer's journey. You've probably got to be reasonably good, either in front of the camera if it's video or um, in, front, in front of the microphone and how do you get good well one of the best ways to get good is to keep on practicing and do your own content on a regular basis summits can be wonderful um, just, just going back to summits um, for many reasons you know to build your authority but also to build your list as well when yeah. people opt in um, then um, you can that they're highly engaged with you um, you can if you do it right make them aware of any products or services that, 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 that you do offer as well. Um, you can perhaps even use it as a revenue stream. And that's next on Bootstrapping Your Dreams Show. So the big question is this, how are ambitious people like us who don't have a lot of resources, did not go to Ivy League colleges, were not born into wealth, how do we become resourceful enough, use our creativity, our dedication and a little bit of crazy to bootstrap our way to realizing our dreams. Whether it is launching a new company, launching a new app, or making it to the top of the corporate ladder. That is the question. And this podcast will give you the answers. Hey listeners and viewers, we have created a tremendous community of bootstrappers, entrepreneurs, and professionals who are ambitious, resourceful, and want to get things done. We brainstorm, support, and help each other out. Come join us navigate to bootstrapping.group that is bootstrapping.group if you like this video do not forget to hit that like button now or if you want us to improve our content go ahead and hit the thumbs down button and give us your feedback in the comment section below here at tetra noodle we are passionate about entrepreneurship technology and innovation every week we bring you insightful and engaging interviews, tips, tricks, and strategies to help you grow your business or rise in your corporate profession. So if you're new here, please consider subscribing. And do not forget to hit that bell icon so that you are notified when we publish new content. Hello and welcome to this new episode of Bootstrapping Your Dreams Show. I'm your host, Manu Jagarwal, and today we'll be talking with David Bain. David is a digital marketing trainer and a podcast host, having published his first podcast episode way, way, way back in 2006. <laughs> I'm not even sure whether people knew what podcast is back then, but awesome. Um, since then, he has interviewed over 500 digital marketing experts and edited every single episode himself. So, you know, that's, that's a huge task for sure. Uh, kudos to you for doing that. Uh, you can find him over at digitalmarketingradio.com. Welcome, 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 David. Manoj, thank you so much for inviting me to be on. It's a pleasure to be with you. Awesome. So uh, digital marketing, uh, this, this is a hot topic and a lot of people want to understand what it is all about. Uh, a lot of people struggle with it, including myself. I'm trying to uh, figure this out myself. So why don't we start there? Tell us a little bit about what digital marketing is. I think what digital marketing is has evolved a lot over time and if you go back 10 years plus it was very technical and it was perhaps just one topic by itself and you could be an expert at digital marketing as one topic 10 plus years ago but nowadays there are so many different niches there are so many different technologies and areas channels it's impossible to be a master of everything yeah. but the nice thing is is that nowadays it's embracing great uh, historical good marketing practices so it's not just about um, technicalities now it's actually about um, integrating quality uh, long-lived marketing approaches that um, have stood the test of time with technologies that work for today's environment and then looking at your customer first of all and then mapping digital marketing channels that are appropriate for your customer's journey I see. And as you put it, uh, you know, digital marketing has become more more complex. There are more disciplines in this. You know, there's SEO, there's email marketing, there's a whole bunch of other 
types of digital marketing. So uh, can you elaborate a little bit about that? Like, you know, what are the main disciplines that you focus on? Sure. I mean, you can look at many different areas as I alluded to, but it's very difficult to do lots at the same time and actually do it to a good standard. So you've got to ideally focus in on one or two areas that are right for your business at um, this moment in time. If you're a local business, uh, I think um, Google's um, Google My Business, local SEO is very, very important. You need to be thinking about things like reviews of your business, about how your business is listed in search engines, how people find your business and what people are saying about you online. That's probably uh, the most important thing at the moment from a local business perspective. Uh, If you are a B2B type business, um, you would want to probably focus a lot on content marketing to begin with, on writing quality articles to answer common customer queries and build up a library of content and then use different digital channels and then use those answers as touch points within those channels. Uh If you're in the B2C environment, then perhaps um, you want to be a little bit more creative. Um, You want to be reaching out to people en masse. So you want to be Uh considering things like chatbots at the moment. That has the potential at the moment with uh, relatively low overheads per person um, to get you noticed by, by thousands of people. So it probably depends on whether your local business B2B or B2C. Awesome. That's great. And now let's talk about podcasting. So how uh, do you consider podcasts to be a component of digital marketing, um, if you will? Yeah, I mean, it's a communications channel. Um, it's it's a way to to touch people. And the way that you use that communications channel isn't necessarily going to be the same for every single business out there. Um, it could be a good way to keep in touch with people who you have done business with in the past. And simply remind them um, every few weeks, whatever it, um, however often you actually publish a new episode, to remind them the, that you actually exist. It's a good way to create uh, quality content and keep them in touch with your brand. Um, but it also could be a way um, to make people discover your brand for the first time, either your business brands or your your, your personal brand. And um, in general, um, it's um, an episodic style of content marketing. Um, so it's it's unlikely to be um, a one-off big splash and then never done again. Podcasting is obviously more done on a regular basis. Um, so that if that's the case, then uh, people are more likely to be regular subscribers. So it's a channel that um, you would, ha- if you're going to use successfully in your business, you'd be unlikely to talk about your products and services or the issues in relation to your products and services directly, you'd probably go above that and um, select more of a broad category um, to catch people in general and then introduce um, them to the the specialities that you do from there subtly. Got it. And uh, will you recommend, uh, what do you think is more impactful, uh, starting your own podcast or going on other podcast shows and uh, uh, sharing your knowledge as a guest? I think both can be incredibly impactful. I've had guests of my own podcast come to me and say, we've tracked sales directly to appearing as a guest on your podcast. And that's that's a great thing to hear uh, as a podcaster. Um, But how do you actually be a successful guest on a podcast? Well, you've probably got to be reasonably good, either in front of camera if it's video or um, in, front, in front of the microphone and how do you get yeah. good? Well, one of the best ways to get good is to keep on practicing and do your own content on a regular basis. So mm. if you did your own show for a hundred episodes um, with a view to improving your technique, the, the way that um, you're able to um, give an overview of the subject matter that um, you wanted to portray yourself as an expert as, um, mm-hmm. then you're only going to be a better guest in the future if you if you do your own show. So I, I, I would say the first step for most people should probably be contemplating starting their own show and then the world's their oyster after that. Awesome. That's great. And so um, any, uh, so, you know, we have a lot of bootstrappers, a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, startup founders and, and professionals in the audience. And um, they always, you know, they, they ask me what is the best way to start a podcast. So what are your views? Can you share some insights? Because obviously you have much more experience in, in this world than I do. Uh, what are your views? How does uh, one go about uh, starting a podcast and, and putting it out there? 
Sure, absolutely. I think that one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they jump straight onto live video to begin with. Mm. And they haven't got decent audio quality. They don't necessarily know what they're talking about. And that can be okay to begin with, to engage with people to do a two-minute video. But uh, if you want to go live for half an hour, you've got to have a certain structure to the content that you intend to share with your audience. And if you're going to be on air for that length of time, you, want to, you don't want to be thinking about things like uh, the quality of your sound and um, the technicalities of anything. So I would suggest actually a um, four-step process uh, to get to live video from podcasting and, and people to work on that and to start off to begin with on pre-recorded audio podcasts. So at the moment we're recording this uh, on video. So we've got to think about things like, if we can, looking directly into the camera, uh, thinking about um, how we come across on video as well as the quality of our audio and the quality of our content. So there's a few different plates that are, are, are spinning there potentially. And if you're thinking of too many things at the same time, you're not necessarily going to portray the content that you want to portray uh, within your message. So if you're only focusing on the audio, if you're only focusing on pre-recorded content that you know isn't of great pressure because you can always redo it, then it's not going to be a pressurized environment. It's, it's the kind of thing that you can just get right and take your time to get right. So pre-recorded audio is a way that I'd suggest to, to get started with. Get a reasonable kind of microphone. Uh, I like dynamic microphones. I like microphones like the AT ATR2100 or the Samsung Q2U. Um, they're really nice because they've got a small sweet spot. So if you move your mouth away from the microphone, they're not really going to pick you up that much. And that means that if you're away from um, the, the microphone or someone else is away from the microphone, perhaps even in the same room, you've got a fridge or an air conditioner or something, your microphone's not going to pick up that noise. So that getting used to using a microphone like that, talking four inches or so away from that, talking around the microphone with your message is a good yeah. skill to have for doing live video in the future, but you don't necessarily want to start with that. So I, I would start with pre-recorded audio, move on to doing an audio show, but as live. So I've got, um, I love funny, silly noises like bumper noises. I've got a, an iPad that's, uh, that's hooked up to my mixer here. So I could easily press a button and, and do, um, you know, some kind of special effect. And, but I also create my intros and outros of my podcasts live without actually having to insert them in afterwards. So it saves me on editing time. So I would say the second time, the second phase is to actually get used to producing your show as live. So it saves a lot of production time, a lot of post-production time. Nice. Then after you, uh, after you do that, you can probably move on to live video, um, or, or sorry, move on to video. Um, now we're doing video at the moment, but we're not doing live video. Um, so with video, uh, pre-recorded video, I guess if the worst thing happens, I, I, uh, I fail with internet connection, it's not a major problem at all. Um, if um, one of us drops out for some reason, we can always get going with the recording again. Um, it, it's not so pressurized. Uh, doing a video call like that. Uh, but the fourth step would be doing it as a live video. And then when you do it live, you've got that virtual audience in front of you as well. So you're bringing in an additional skill set, and that's to monitor the screen in front of you, uh, have a look at comments, bring other people into the conversation as well, see what people are saying, ask people people's questions and answer those questions live. So if you, if you jump, jump straight to that stage, it's, it's not going to be as good quality. And as you're going through those stages, you improve your ability uh, as a uh, broadcaster, as a, as, as a performer online, really, and you improve your ability, of course, as a podcast guest, hopefully, as well. So if you want to be a guest on other people's podcasts, that's a good process to go through. Awesome. That's great. Well, thank you so much for that detailed answer. Um, now, what about distribution? So once you have produced the show and, you know, obviously it, uh, there's a lot that goes into producing a show and and uh, even recording your first show, like uh, the, the disappointing thing uh, from some podcasters I hear is, you know, I've done so much work and I've produced maybe five, 10 episodes, but nobody's listening to it. Nobody's downloading it. Um, so what do you recommend in terms of distribution? How do people get started on that front? 
Yeah, I mean, 10 years ago, you could just hit publish for anything online and you'd have an audience there automatically. Uh, it started off with Google SEO and moved on to social media. Once you published on social media, you got thousands of likes and uh, you could drive a lot of traffic that way. But it's not the case anymore. You've got to really have a marketing strategy, a publishing strategy once you actually hit publish. So spend as much, if not more time, on your distribution strategy as you do on your content production. Uh, and if you do that, then at least you're gonna give yourself a good chance to, to get a decent number of eye, eyebrow, uh, eyebrow, eyebrows, 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 oh, eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what I was gonna say though is, be prepared for not much of an audience to begin with. Be prepared to publish 50 episodes to begin with without much of an audience. Because what you need is that ability to perform and hone your own voice. Uh, unless you uh, go through those kind of numbers of episodes, you're not going to get your show into a structure that you're comfortable with, that you can really relate to and your audience can relate to as well. So don't worry about the fact that you don't have much of an audience to begin with. You can always use that content in some other way in the future. But obviously, moving forward, Ideally, you want to build up an email list. Uh, you want to tell people when you've actually published or when you're just going live. Uh, you want to take segments of your video and publish those segments with transcripts on sites like Twitter natively. Uh, you want to publish the video natively on Twitter. You want to publish the video natively on LinkedIn as well and on Facebook as well. Uh, if you want, you can pay $5 or so on Facebook to get a little bit more um, paid promotion. Generally on Facebook, you've got to pay a little bit to uh, get a decent audience there as well, but you can drive people back to your podcast from there. But one platform that I'm finding particularly useful and successful at the moment is LinkedIn. Uh, I've got quite a few contacts on LinkedIn. I've got maybe about 13,000 contacts on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. but And I've got approval to broadcast live on LinkedIn. And what I find is when I broadcast live on LinkedIn, I, I get at least 50 people watching live and engaging with me. But that, that video within a couple of days will get 2,000 views or so. I've you had wow. videos on, on, on LinkedIn that have got 10,000 views quite quickly. Uh, the important thing you know, about LinkedIn is to you know, add that um, transcription if you can uh, and um, try and engage with people who comment on your video as well. So uh, I'd encourage people to, to, to really experiment with video on LinkedIn at the moment. Awesome. That's great. Uh, now, you have been in this game for a long, long time. So tell us a little bit about how podcasting has changed from the early days. Um, I, I mean, you must have been one of the, the first few, uh, like 2006, as I said, I don't even know whether uh, people knew what podcasting was. I think iPhone came out, what, 2007 or something? Yeah, the, the iPhone did, but um, iTunes came out a little bit earlier. Um, I think iTunes came out in, in 2006, um, mm. and you, you used to use it on your on your computer first of all, and then you you could right. um, you could you could sync that um, with your device. But right. podcasting itself started about 2004 or so, uh, and, and there, there were only a few people involved in it then. It was really just um, when iTunes launched that um, that people started to get into podcasting. Um, I remember one of the first podcasts in the UK was actually. Ricky Gervais. Oh, really? <laughs> and, and, and that was, that was quite a popular podcast at the time. Um, that would happen to be made into to a cartoon series, the, the original podcast recordings. But I think it's not really the medium that's changed. Um, it's um, the way that people have used it that's changed. Um, I think, first of all, there, is more, there are more categories of podcasts that are available now and uh, the production quality, the, the quality of the audio and um, the, the foresight into how the content links together has, has really changed significantly. I think in the last five years or so, or, the, or since podcasting got really popular in smartphones, then there was a real focus on things like audio quality. I, I used to record my podcast back in 2006, 2007 on, on a headset. Um, all, all I did was um, um, read articles that I'd written um, it, it, into audio form, and I still had a decent number of listeners. I, I wasn't that consistent about podcasting back then, and I really got only embraced um, semi-professional podcasting from the year 2014 onwards. 
I see. I see. And, uh, you know, there are um, approximately what maybe a, about a million podcasts across the world. From, I may be incorrect, but let's say a million. Something like that, please, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, only a handful of them tend to get some audience or uh, from what I know, the quality uh, is not as great for majority of the podcast. So in your opinion, what makes uh, for a good podcast? What are the good characteristics of, of uh, you know, a, a podcast that will gain audience? You're never going to be a popular odca- uh, podcast overnight. Uh, mm-hmm. y- you have to keep on publishing episodes to begin with. I think if you start off to begin with on a frequency that's less than once a week, you're mm-hmm. probably going to struggle to get much of an audience because uh, iTunes, um, or sorry, Apple Podcasts now want to see recent podcast episodes and they'll increase your ranking uh, by the number of recent downloads that you've had over the last 24 hours. And you're giving yourself a better chance to get that by publishing more episodes. If you just have old episodes there, you're you're less likely to get those download numbers that are going to increase your ranking. So mm-hmm. you, you've got to f- initially focus on consistency uh, and then reaching out to your target audience and asking them what they ask, you know, what they don't like about the content that you produce. There, there's some great stats available in, in Podcast Connect now, which is a platform that Apple provided podcasters with. And you can see things like how much of your podcast your listeners listen to. And that's really worthwhile to pay attention to because you can see what episodes are more popular than others and, and where people drop off. So if you analyze those stats and, and have a look at where people are getting a little bit uh, fed up with your content, then hopefully you can adjust that in the future. So you hone your content, be consistent, get your audio quality right. The the biggest uh, reason that I'll switch off from podcasts is audio quality. Um, Things like beard scratching, um, uh, up and down uh, audio volume. Uh, Sometimes the guest is at a completely different volume compared with the the, 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 the podcast host as well. Uh, There's a a few great websites, um, um, one that springs to mind called Alphonic that you you can go to. And um, if you use that um, website, A-U-P-H-O-N-I-C, um, just search for that. And um, what that will do is it will take your audio and it will ensure that your audio is um, created at um, the uh, industry uh, relevant volume standards as well as cleaning up your audio a little bit. So that, that's okay. a great website to use. So um, uh, I think audio quality is key. Consistency is key. And then make your show format a little bit more unique and different. So b- can bring in different features as, as part of your show to make it fun. That's great. Thank you so much. And how's the audio quality, by the way, on this uh, on this episode right now? Well, I haven't heard it broadcast yet, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I can yeah. certainly hear you well. So that's a good start. Okay. Yeah, you made me insecure for a minute there. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, let's talk about the process of uh, producing a show. So do you follow a process uh, like, uh, you know, um, I assume that you have guests on uh, or is it an individual you talking to the podcast or is it a mixed format? Yeah, I've, I've mostly mostly produced podcasts which involve guests. Uh, the one, the the show that I've recorded most episodes for is Digital Marketing Radio. That show is on a bit of a hiatus at the moment because I've been focusing on uh, another project, which is um, putting a a book together based upon a big online uh, summit that, that that I hosted and creating content from. So you, you can't do everything at the same time. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, with, with regards to kind of Digital Marketing Radio, yeah, that was interview format. Um, it's important to make it as easy as possible for your guests coming on your show and as easy as possible for you as host of the show. Um, so I had my guests use a booking form and actually share with me questions that um, they would suggest that I ask them, um, yeah. as well as a brief intro and outro. I, mean, I could amend that if I wanted to. I then shared with my guests um, a standard um, piece of advice uh, going from how to actually, uh, which microphone to use, how, how to perform well on camera and, uh, and different tips like that. And afterwards, uh, it would probably be published within a month or so, depending on how many shows that I had afterwards. Uh, I, I didn't spend that long on each show. If you go from booking to recording to publishing the episode, I probably only spent about five hours on a, 
on a 30 to 40 minutes episode show. So yeah. it wasn't too intense. Okay. Awesome. And, um, you know, when, when you, when you started, like, obviously right now it should be way different, but when you started, how did you get, uh, the right guests and how did you convince them to come onto the show? Because, uh, when I started, it was a challenge for me for sure. Um, now it's getting easier, but what is your experience about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I probably had a few decent contacts in the digital marketing industry and that's where the uh, where my contacts mainly were beforehand. That's what the podcast was about. Um, so it wasn't a massive challenge, but I did use a website called Source Bottle. Um, and Source Bottle is um, where people go to, where they want um, publicity themselves. They want to appear in newspaper articles or they want to appear in podcasts. So that's a good place to get people. The only challenge with that or services like that I find is that people will tend to be a little bit overly self-promotional uh, compared with people that really want to share content mm -hmm. so ideally you don't want to be using services like that for every single episode that you produce um, maybe yeah. for the first 20 or so episodes 30 or so episodes that's that's fine to do that but once you do that then you can actually start to reach out to people once you've had one or two names that people will recognize in your industry on your podcast, then you can start to reach out with people and say, um, I, I, I'd love to have you as an episode on my podcast. You know, we've, we've done loads of episodes already. You might uh, recognize this person's name. It would only take half an hour of your time. Um, how do you feel about that? And, and, and that's a much more appealing proposition than contacting someone when you haven't actually got an active show up yet. Yeah. Okay, that's those are good pointers. Now uh, you are uh, you are a big name in the digital marketing industry. You are an influencer. So uh, can you take us through your journey? Like how did it all happen? Maybe share some stories, interesting stories or mistakes that you made along the way. <laughs> yes, I could uh, maybe be here all day with mistakes. But <laughs> look, um, I think being an influencer is all about perception and yeah i'm not saying i'm an influencer i think uh, uh, certain people um in my audience may say that and certain people wouldn't necessarily say that so the name doesn't really mean anything to me it's all about have you got an engaged audience that um appreciate the content that you actually offer and uh would that audience be willing to follow you along to another project in the future or um, um, turn up when you do something live in the future? So it's not about quantity of um, your audience or, or quantity of the people that you influence. It's all about um, whether or not you have an engaged audience. And mm -hmm. if you have an engaged audience who are willing to follow you, then, th then that, that's absolutely wonderful. And in terms of my journey to try and create an engaged audience, I think to begin with, I, I wanted to publish content um, to build myself as an authority or somewhat of an authority within a, a certain industry niche. So I wanted to, back in 2007, uh, I decided to uh, deliver a seminar. So I, I, I put on a seminar. It was about two and a half hours long. I had um, a professional um, videographer video me. Uh, and then I had the, the, the video actually published on, on, on YouTube. And I think that, that the video got about 100,000 views. I did something similar in in 2012, it would have been, um, called the four phases of digital marketing. Um, that's, um, if, if, if that was ranking the top of YouTube for the phrase digital marketing for probably a couple of years or so, I, I haven't concentrated on it much, but as far as I recall, it's, it's got about 150,000 views or so. So I think if you put up quality content uh, and perhaps lengthy content as well and, and build online courses um, with a view to attracting an audience who will stick with you, then that's probably a good way to start with. Uh, I published a course on Udemy uh, called What is SEO? That, that, that's mm -hmm. got about 70,000 students on Udemy as well. Awesome. It's, it, you can't publish any old content. You've really got to think about the framework of the content, the quality of the content, and the, the quality of everything, including um, audio video quality as well as the, the quality of the content itself. So it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. But I think maybe one of the mistakes I made was sometimes I 
published content that was either too generic or not directly related to an industry that I wanted to build an, uh, a business in. So right. perhaps um, I, I found it challenging in, cer- in certain circumstances to, to, to funnel that traffic or, or use that uh, engaged audience in a manner that, that was useful from a monetary perspective to me. I see. That's great. And now let's talk about uh, web summits because I know um, you've been hosting web web summits as well and I've been uh, hearing a lot about them uh, lately. So uh, can you first of all tell us a little bit about what a web summit is? Yeah, sure. I mean, to a certain degree, that's the fifth stage in the um, four-step process that I was telling you about going from pre-recorded audio um, as live audio, going back to pre-recorded uh, video for the, the third stage, live video for the fourth stage, and then the fifth stage, then you pull that together into summits. Now, um, all that is really is doing um, eight, 12, 16 different live video sessions all in one, all in one day. And then uh, uh, hopefully encouraging loads of people to watch and building an audience from the content that you've produced before um, to that particular summit, but also hopefully encouraging your guests to really promote that, maybe having a couple of sponsors to promote it as well. So the idea is to get hopefully over a thousand people um, engaged in that and watching that and using that to to really build your platform within your industry. And I produced a summit like that um, several months ago. And um, the intention was to take that content and turn it into a book. I've done that once before. I I published a book called Digital Marketing in 2017 as a result of doing a summit. And um, I'm publishing a book that's going to be called Marketing Now in the next couple of months. I haven't even got a website up to to, to promote it just now. So um, I can't really do any kind of promotion for that. But um, I I think it's a great next step after summits to, to use that content methodically uh, to publish as a book. Uh, but um, summits can be wonderful, um, just, just going back to summits, um, for many reasons, you know, to build your authority, but also to build your list as well. When yeah. people opt in, um, then um, you can, they're, they're highly engaged with you. Um, you can, if you do it right, make them aware of any products or services that, 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 that you do offer as well. Um, you can perhaps even use it as a revenue stream. Some people do the live summit for free, but they make the live summit so long, maybe 12 plus hours, that it's mm. very difficult to stick on there and watch it live. So they save something like, well, $49 or $99 to have lifetime access to all these recordings. Um, and then that can be a bit of a revenue stream as well. So there are, there are many uses for summits. Yeah, great. And so you brought up this point about live. So does it have to be live or can it not be pre-recorded as you put it? Like, you know, people are not going to probably watch it, uh, you know, continuously for 12 hours. So what is, what is your opinion about that? Right. Um, well, I, I guess I could take the point that you were making in, in two different ways there. Um, so firstly, if you were broadcasting a summit live, then what you also can do is uh, reach out to influencers for a presentation and ask them for a video recording of them making the presentation and then use that video recording as part of your live broadcast. And if you do it right, it, it really looks as if it is a live broadcast. Ideally, you'll get the presenter to also attend the summit and engage with the live chat so it looks as if they're um, that they're doing it live uh, and then obviously the second thought I had in, in relation to what you're saying there was yes you can you can cut chop up the live summit into different recordings and offer that as a package and give people the um, uh, the, the recorded video afterwards if you don't want it, uh, to sell it afterwards you've got some incredible content to chop up and actually use for the next possibly year on your social media uh, yeah. if, if you do that right and, and drive people towards some um, uh, t- towards your other other content or business that's great well uh, those are really good insights and um, just as one of the last questions uh, do you use any specific software for uh, organizing the web summits for organizing web summits um, I will use different things it, it probably depends on who I'm 
who I'm hosting it for. Uh, I'm a big fan of a bit of software called vMix, uh, and um, it's it's really really stable for me. So I, I use that to to bring in different speakers uh, to take different screen captures. I can, for instance, use Google Hangouts, which I believe is going away quite soon, so I might have to change that strategy, to take in different guests uh, sharing their presentations into vMix and then live broadcast to somewhere like LinkedIn or or, or a Facebook group uh, using vMix. So so, so vMix is a great bit of software for, um, for, for producing live video. Awesome, that's great. Well, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing all this knowledge about uh, podcasting, digital marketing, web summits. It has been a a really uh, interesting conversation, very enlightening. Thank you so much. Um, It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. And before I uh, let you go, can you tell us how people can reach out? I mean, I can see uh, the the URL right there, but still, if you can uh, uh, let let the audience know how they can reach out to you, that would be great. Yeah, sure. I mean, LinkedIn or, or Twitter sl- slash David Bain or the website digitalmarketingradio.com are probably the, the best places at the moment. As I mentioned, going to be publishing this book called Marketing Now. Uh, I'm not going to share the URL of that just now because there's no website published there um, at the moment. But during the latter part of the year, that, um, that, that should be a good place to, um, to, to find me. Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much again. Thanks. And that's all for now. Until next time. And if you are an existing or an aspiring tech entrepreneur, then I invite you to check out my new online workshop, Bootstrapping Your Tech Startup Dreams. Go to bootstraptechstartup.com and sign up for free. I want to make sure that more successful and sound decisions are made every day in your tech projects. Let's start finding solutions to your problems. So go to bootstraptechstartup.com and I look forward to helping you with your tech projects. If you want more engaging videos and insightful interviews with industry's thought leaders, then check out other videos we have picked for you. The link is right there. And if you want to be notified about our new content, please do consider subscribing to our channel.